How many people do you know who have suffered miscarriage? There are important things for us to know how to help them and certain things we have to be sure not to do or say. Find out more on Defending Life. I'm Janet Morana, Executive Director of Priest for Life and co-founder of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. Welcome to our Defending Life program. I'm joined here today by our Associate Director, Father Dennis Wild. Father, welcome to our program. Thanks, Janet. Great to be back. Well, of course, we always like to open our show with a prayer from our Pro-Life Reflections for Every Day, written by Father Frank Pavone, our National Director. And today's uh, reflection comes from Hebrews 12, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet. A woman wrote to Priests for Life, Up until I visited this site, I had been pro-choice. After seeing the images on your site, there was no decision to be made. I figured that whatever hardships having a baby at this time would bring me far more easier than living with the guilt if I were to get an abortion. The pictures had such a powerful effect on me. They helped me to be strong. Yes, thank you, Lord, for the strength that comes from knowing the truth. Amen. Amen. Well, of course, people can get uh, Pro-Life Reflections for every day from uh, Priest for Life, uh, from our online store or call our office. Uh, we'll be happy to send it to them. And as we said, you know, today's topic is miscarriage. And, you know, I know I've been fortunate I never had a miscarriage, but I know many people who have had. And very often, people don't say the right things. You know, they don't respond correctly. Um, the mother and the father, uh, it's a deep loss. And of course, recently, uh, sadly, uh, Brian Kemper from our pastoral team, he and his wife lost a baby to miscarriage. And I thought it'd be interesting, Father, to take a look from a, a man's perspective of how he felt, he and his wife. So mm -hmm. let's take a look what Brian had to say about miscarriage. One of the questions I get asked more than anything else is, how many kids do you have? Uh, my answer, usually sometimes a funny answer is, oh, just seven. But uh, I usually say, I've got seven children that are, uh, that are living here and two with the Lord. We've, um, we've lost two children, my wife and I, to, to miscarriage. And it's, it's not, the, not the most pleasant situation to go through. It's, it's pretty rough. And I, I, I know I've talked to so many moms and dads who, who have lost a child to miscarriage and, and what they went through. And the second miscarriage we had was an especially heartbreaking one for us as it happened a little later in the pregnancy. I woke up one morning um, and heard my wife screaming. And when I went to the bathroom, um, she, had, she had lost um, our 12-week-old child. And uh, the hardest part was looking down and seeing our child's body floating and uh, seeing my wife bleeding. I remember that day grabbing the body of our child and then my wife getting her wrapped up in a towel quickly and rushing her to the hospital and um, having to the doctors having to rush in to save her life. Um, I remember the specialist running in saying, oh my God, is that, is that her blood pressure? And uh, he was able to stop the bleeding and um, you know, my whole life flashed in front of my eyes that moment when, when I didn't know whether my wife was going to make it or not. We called the, uh, the, ch the pastor of the church I had been going to at that time. At that time, I was, I was uh, a Presbyterian and going to a church, and, and we told him what happened. And I asked him about planning a funeral. And he said, well, we've, we've never done that before. I don't, I don't know what to do. So I had to call the funeral home myself, and thank God it was such a, a friendly voice uh, from that funeral home, an understanding voice that invited us in and, and told us that they were going to take care of the cost of the burial and the, the plot would be donated by the local cemetery, and there was very little cost to us at all. And uh, I went home that night after meeting with them and at first, and 
we took our child, the body of the child, home and we gathered all of our other children around and we said our goodbyes. And uh, I asked my children, what do you think his name is? And I remember them said, Benjamin. Benjamin. And we named him Benjamin Davis Kemper. And uh, we all said our goodbyes. And it, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't anything like traumatic or anything with the kids. They honestly were seeing their little brother. And they were, they were glad to say goodbye and to be a part of saying his name. And to this day, they still go to his gravesite all the time and leave little toys for him and pinwheels and sometimes lollipops and different stuff. They see Benjamin as their little brother. They know they have a little brother named Benjamin. Well, as we were getting prepared for the funeral, uh, I went to church that Sunday before the funeral. My wife stayed home on bed rest. And uh, as the funeral was being announced at church, the pastor actually paused and gave a disclaimer. He said, I know there's other people here that have had miscarriages and haven't had a funeral, but you know what? Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. It's just something the Kempers chose to do. No, it's not just something that we chose to do. We gave dignity to our son by offering him a burial, a funeral, which we should do for every single human person. And our son, Benjamin, is a human person. He is our child. And then when it came time for the funeral, the pastor and one other person from the church came. And I was shocked that the other elders and the elders and the other deacons weren't there. Everybody from my, son, my kid's karate class was there, but people from my church weren't there. And when I called to confront them, I said to the pastor, I said, if this had been any other funeral of any other person that died in our church, they would have been there. And he said, yes, Brian, but you know what? This wasn't any other funeral. This was just a miscarriage. Probably the most painful words I've ever heard in my life. That my son was reduced to just a miscarriage. It's not just a miscarriage. I love my son. My son is up there waiting for me. He's with Jesus right now. But he was my son. He was a full human person. And we have to understand, we have to understand that every single child in the womb from that very first moment, from that very first moment of conception is a full human person. And we have to be joyous about those children. It's like when John the Baptist leapt at the presence of Christ, who was probably six or seven days old, just a zygote in the womb. There was that joy of who Christ was in that womb. Benjamin Davis in that womb was my son and is my son up there with Jesus right now. So I encourage you, if you know anyone that's going through a miscarriage or been through it, treat them just like anyone who has lost any family member, because that's really what has happened. They have lost a family member, not a fetus, but a family member. Well, if you notice what Brian uh, said there, that they mo lost a member of their family. You know, that was the key point he pointed out there. And, and everyone around them, they weren't as sensitive to that. Including fact. the pastor, who was uh, somebody who should have been available to see that, but I guess not wanting to hurt feelings, you know, reduced that, reduced that life to right. just another miscarriage. Yeah. And if you notice, the whole family was involved, even his children, children his children. Yeah. You know, very often people are afraid, oh, should we discuss this with our children? Absolutely. Because you see how healing it was. They acknowledge that they have a sibling who passed away, Benjamin uh, there. And, and the whole family is involved and they honor him every year. I know uh, when that time of year comes, they, ha they have a mass set for Benjamin and they focus in on remembering Benjamin. It's like they have a little angel in heaven, right. you know? Well, we have a lot more to talk and suggestions to give about miscarriage. Stay with, tuned after this message and come back because we have a lot more advice to tell you about dealing with miscarriage. Stay tuned. Powerful new voices are arising in the debate over abortion the voices of those who have actually experienced it. From coast to coast, women and men who have lost children to abortion are speaking out about its pain and devastation and about the healing and forgiveness they have found through the pro-life movement. Their witness is changing hearts and minds. Former U.S. Senator Zell Miller writes, the most poignant sight for me at this year's annual pro-life march and demonstration in Washington, D.C 
was the large number of women holding signs saying they regretted their abortions. And the United States Supreme Court wrote, it seems unexceptionable to conclude some women come to regret their choice to abort the infant life they once created and sustained. Severe depression and loss of esteem can follow, a decision so fraught with emotional consequence. Welcome back to our Defending Life program where our discussion today is on miscarriage. Well, as you know, uh, uh, Father Brian was able to work uh, with a funeral director uh, to um, have a proper burial for this child. And recently we were able to talk to a funeral director and let's see what they had to say, how they work with these couples of children that are miscarried. I have a heart for taking care of uh, families who lost children through miscarriage and uh, stillborn um, because uh, in my first year of business in 1971, uh, my brother lost a child uh, and uh, we had a, which affected the whole family uh, very, very much. And we had to arrange for the burial of, uh, of that stillborn in a plot, in a, uh, his wife's plot in, um, in Staten Island. I decided at that point that I would n not charge for the, um, funeral service or burial of a stillborn or miscarriage uh, because of I saw what every family, family goes through. Mm -hmm. uh, on admittance to the hospital, uh, they should tell the um, administrative staff there that they, they want the baby um, buried or, or taken care of and not disposed of. In, in, in Staten Island, we're fortunate that both uh, uh, maternity, maternity and OB wards in, in both Staten Island hospitals uh, give people the option of uh, calling a funeral director uh, or having them dispose uh, of the, the fetus, but they also recommend that they call us if they have nobody else to call because we do not charge for that service. I recommend if they're not in the same position as us in Staten Island that they should go uh, to a local funeral director, find out what services are available. There are many funeral directors who will take care of this pro bono uh, or at a very, very, very slight charge. Ma many, many years ago, uh, before they had a children's section in, in, in Resurrection Cemetery in Staten Island, uh, we were called by Father Pavone, who was a uh, assistant pastor at St. Charles Church in Staten Island, uh, and also now the the uh, director of uh, Priests for Life uh, nationally, uh, who came to us and uh, had two uh, test tubes that had babies, uh, which are rec were recognizable uh, in the test tubes, and asked us if we could uh, if we could take care of the burial of uh, those two two babies, and uh, along with uh, the Archdiocese of New York and, and Resurrection Cemetery, they uh, donated a grave and uh, those babies were placed together in a casket and uh, buried with full uh, dignity in, in that cemetery. There was an occasion once where we were called uh, uh, by the public administrator uh, on Staten Island who uh, is responsible for the burial of anybody and he didn't want the stillborns to go to a city cemetery where we buried um, nine stillborns uh, at one time in the children's plot at Resurrection Cemetery, Father Pavone from the uh, Priest for Life uh, officiated at that service, uh, and uh, it was very touching. Uh, just just about uh, three months ago, uh, I met with the uh, uh, with one of my organizations, which was the uh, Order of the Golden Rule, which is a uh, organization of over 881 funeral directors, and at a uh, brainstorming meeting I mentioned to them at that point uh, what had transpired with the burial of the nine stillborns uh, in uh, Staten Island in, in Resurrection Cemetery and how the service went and um, I also brought them clippings from the newspaper and uh, I think that went a long way to get them to understand that we really should take care of these things in a, in a proper way when approached. 
and maybe go through the same scenario that I went to notify the hospitals that we will do this pro bono. It, you know, it's wonderful to have uh, such a good people like that that are willing to help with couples. Uh, and I want to encourage any funeral directors, you know a funeral director, you're watching this program, you can be in touch with us. We'll put you in touch with that funeral director if you want some advice about how he got the word out and how he, and he works even with the hospitals, uh, you know, in the local hospitals. So it's a marvelous thing, you know? And I think also for the clergy to become, you know, more aware of what is going on here. Uh, first of all, that child is a child in heaven. I remember when Bishop Balakwa in Pittsburgh mentioned to Karen Santorum at the time that baby died, she said, pray to the baby, not pray for the baby, to the baby, the baby's in heaven. And we need to be very sensitive to that and also to give the people the hope that we will be re rejoined once again in eternity with that child. That's right. And so therefore, you know, the couples uh, need to be, uh, you know, people should be sensitive. You know, um, if you know someone who's lost a child from miscarriage, well, treat it the same as you would if they just lost a born child. Right? Would you not send a, a mask card to the family, a sympathy card? Sure. Uh, would you, uh, if they're going to have a service, please try to attend the service. Be there for them. Ask them. You know, maybe some people make a casserole and bring it right. over and go visit them. Mm -hmm. Do all those things. Whether it's a miscarried child or a born child, behave the same way. Right? And I know the very hurtful thing some people say is, oh, well, oh, it was, it was the best. Oh, you can move on. You know, oh, you could always have other children. People don't realize for the mother, she's lost that child and that father and they're grieving. They don't want to hear they could always have other children or it was nature took its course. They want you to acknowledge their child That's right. and, and have yeah. the same grief. Well, I know we have a lot more to talk about, Father, and when we come back, right after this message, we're going to take a question from you, our viewers, and give you some action you can do. Stay tuned. I'm happy to offer you today my book, Recall Abortion, written for the observance of the 40th year since Roe v. Wade. This book uses a play on words. The pro-life movement asks society to recall abortion, but that is to remember its devastating impact rather than to retreat into denial. The men and women of the Silent No More Awareness campaign recall the despair and pain of abortion, helping others to be mindful that it is not a solution. The pro-life movement also demands that the government recall abortion, just as it has recalled various forms of surgery and other products, which, though once promoted, later proved harmful to those who bought them. This book presents with fresh information why abortion is a product so bad and so faulty that the only appropriate and long overdue response is to recall it. You can order my book, Recall Abortion, by calling our office at our toll-free number, 888 735-3448 or go online prolifeproducts.org. Thank you. Welcome back to our Defending Life program and now we're going to take a question from you, our viewers. Well, Father Dennis, today's question comes from Christine from Providence, Rhode Island and she writes, I heard Jana talking about her book, Recall Abortion, and I was wondering what to say to those who tell me that they do not regret their abortion. Christine, thank you for your question. We thank Jana too for her book, Recall Abortion, which of course draws on the testimonies of those who recall their own abortion experience and all the damage, pain, and despair it brings, and then builds the case that because of this damage, the government should issue a recall of abortion that is, remove it from the legally available services in our nation. The numbers of those who regret their abortion are too large to know, of course. The Silent No More Awareness campaign enables us to hear some of those women and men, but there are countless others who suffer in silence. What then about those who say they do not regret their abortion? Certainly some people say this, but so do those who today are expressing their regret. In other words, the regret people have for their abortions come about through a process of honestly facing what has happened and identifying the source of the pain. This means stripping away layers of denial that can last for years, even decades. Many of those who regret their abortions can point to a day when they did not. This is often a defense mechanism that kicks in at the beginning. We sometimes say we did the right thing because we're protecting ourselves. 
it's simply too painful to admit that what we did actually was wrong, and especially that it was the taking of the life of one's own child. But as time goes on and we have more experiences or perhaps benefit from the guidance of a friend or an expert, we often connect the dots and understand the damage a past action has caused. This is what happens with the countless people who re get abortion. We do not see people, on the other hand, going the other way, that is from regretting it to not regretting it. Now, if you're talking to someone who is saying they do not regret their abortion, always be kind and gentle with them. You may want to invite them to read the testimonies of those who do speak about their abortion experience. Thanks for your question. At any time, you can go to ProLifeQuestions.com to send us more questions. Well, thank you, Father. And of course, I want our viewers to know we can only answer a question at a time here on our show, but we have our public outreach department stands on by every day to answer their phone calls, their snail mail and email questions. So we're at their service. And also, too, I'd like to mention we have our Priest for Life newsletter, which, again, is sent free of charge, either snail mail or email. They can contact us if they'd like to get that, because this gives a lot of activity of what's going on, both with Priest for Life and, and our ministries. But now I'd like to talk about our action segment. As you know, mm. there's a special ministry. It's called Back in His Alms Ministry. It was founded by Cameron Malone uh, in Ohio. And uh, we've had a recent chance to talk to get an update from Cameron about this ministry to mis miscarriage, people who've lost children to miscarriage. Yes, it was beautiful. We had a, a phone call on that. And uh, it's beautiful how some of the hospitals are now responding uh, as much as they can. Uh, to the plight of these people, people who uh, do not know that they have a uh, possibility that they can bury their child, but to really take the child and give it a proper, decent burial. Because otherwise, the hospital, up to 20 weeks in some places, uh, considers it biohazard, which is an un unfortunate term right, because we're sad. talking about human beings here. And they usually common cremations or something of that sort in hospitals. But now there's a possibility for people who can sign on to a form and they will be able to, in fact, have their child buried That's and right. at, a, at a particular hospital. So this is taking place in, in Ohio, and uh, the babies under the 20 weeks, uh, after the 20 weeks, certainly, uh, they can be buried in cemeteries. Right, but also, too, as we know from uh, the funeral director, they also can be buried under 20 weeks. It's the people who are losing that child from miscarriage have to speak up because they do have the right uh, to bury the child. And I know of a case where we were participating in a burial of a child only at six weeks of gestation. Right, both. Yeah. So we want to remember that. Well, you know, Father, we just hope more couples will contact us if they'd like information for Back in His Homes Ministry and all the other information we have about miscarriage. It's a subject that we have to keep promoting out there so that these couples can be helped. Amen. Well, thank you, Father. And well, brothers and sisters, thank you, too, for joining us on Defending Life. And remember, we also have a Spanish version of this program on EWTN's Spanish channel. And before we go, let me offer you three items. First, this is The Will to Live, a document to help you and loved ones make medical decisions in difficult circumstances and to protect you and them from being pressured to do things contrary to the moral law. This document enables you to appoint someone you know and trust to speak for you if you cannot speak for yourself and is made according to the laws of each of the 50 states. Father Pavone strongly endorses this document and we will send it to you free of charge. Just contact us at Priest for Life. Second, we offer mass cards both for the living and the deceased and we will send you as many as you want free of charge to enroll your loved ones in the daily masses that are said by Father Pavone, Father Dennis Wild, and the whole Priest for Life family that are celebrated every day. Use these for birthdays, graduations, anniversaries, and other occasions, as well as at those sad moments of saying farewell to those who have died. Let us know how many you want today and we'll send them to you. And third, Pray along with us throughout the year by ordering our new and revised pro-life prayer book called In the Palm of His Hand. You'll find prayers for all occasions and liturgical seasons. And remember, you can invite Father Pavone, Father Dennis, myself, and other members of the Priest for Life team like Alveda King to your churches, communities, and pro-life events. Check out our website for details at priestforlife.org. And on behalf of Father Pavone, our National Director, and all our Priest for Life family, I urge you to let us hear from you. Send us your success stories or questions and comments. And remember, we're not just here to fight abortion, we're here to end it, and we will. Join us next week again on Defending Life.